Hey, this is Misery Loves Company, a weekly reading series presented by MiseryTourism.com, where we welcome outsider and transgressive writers to come and share their work with us. And uh, that's pretty much it. That's the whole blurb. Uh, let's let's get right into this thing. We've been doing this for like six months now. I think we <laughs> we know how it goes. Uh, so first up tonight is Unity. The link to your. Are you with us still, Unity? I think so. Cool. So you turn on some of these lamps. <laughs> So you're going to be reading a piece that was just published on the Bear Creek Gazette this week, right? Yeah, that's right. Awesome. It's all yours. So just a quick word on mythology here. The narrator of this piece is um, Sadie Smith, who used to date one of my alter egos, a guy by the name of Todd Matthews, who he hasn't really... Um, He's not published yet, but he has something coming out. It's, he's a horror author. And he's got something, a few pieces coming out, one on Terror House next month, which is a, I guess I wanna say it's a meth horror, which is about um, interdimensional smut puddlers, peddlers and uh, methamphetamine and docking. So if any of that's of interest. Anyway, this is Sadie Smith. She, she's, a, she's a travel writer. And she was, uh, yeah, she went to Bear Creek. It's called Visiting Bear Creek. I drove for what felt like days I can hardly remember. How many times did I nod off or black out in the road? I remember lowering the Prius's seat to catch a few hours sleep at a rest stop somewhere in Arkansas or was it Nevada? I remember long stretches of nothingness, blank, sandless deserts, with no distinguishing geographical markers whatsoever. No tumbleweeds, no cactus, not even a butte. I recall driving through coniferous forests, the pine boughs weighted heavily under thick blankets of snow and ice. I remember endless cornfields, whispers of giggling children on bicycles, disappearing into the horrible dry stalks. I drove through several towns and cities of various sizes on the way here, saw people of every race, gender, and creed imaginable. Or am I just saying that? To shrink this inescapable feeling of ennui, to avoid confronting my inability to remember anything. I'm so disoriented. I feel pathetic. I miss Todd. Where am I? I know this is meant to be a travelogue, but I can't seem to remember how I got here. Not even a little, or even what city I came from before. Was it Pittsburgh? Something in Florida? Where did me and Todd live? Cincinnati? Sioux Falls? Boise, Idaho? Binghamton? Where? I remember vaguely a chat with an editor, over the phone or by text. Or was it through email? I was so excited for the assignment at first. What happened? It was supposed to be a travelogue, a guide for tourists, covering all the local hot spots, the greasy spoons and watering holes, places where the locals hang out, all that quirky small town flavor. I'd stay in the charming local motel, take in a scenic nature trail. What happened? I saw a strange man wandering around on the outskirts of town today, a sickening smear of greasy white paint dripping off his face and staining his battered potato sack of his suit. He was carrying in his arms what looked to be a dead baby deer, muttering and snorting, and sobbing to himself as he wandered off into the woods, leaving a trail of once white feathers in his wake, casualties of the moldering pair of angel wings he dragged along the ground behind him. I wondered whether he was going to bury the fawn or consume it. I've lost 120 pounds since I arrived in Bear Creek, though I eat nothing but hot dogs. None of the dining establishments in town ever seem to be open when I require sustenance aside from the Brown Bear Hot Dog Stand and Suicide Prevention Center. The stand is staffed with all the failed suicides, the philosophy being that by pouring your blood, sweat, and tears into meaningful labor, the desire to be recycled back into earth will simply vanish. The last time I went to the hot dog stand, the manager, who is always dressed in a mangy, rotten-looking bear suit, was screwing two of the employees behind the counter, a middle-aged gas station-type woman 
and a blonde boy who couldn't have been much older than 17. The bear had them both bent over the deep fryer, side by side, with their pants down around their ankles. He grunted and growled sickeningly as he took turns thrusting himself roughly into his two employees. Mommy, mommy, the boy kept saying when it was his turn to take the bear. Mommy, mommy, daddy bear's fucking me, daddy bear's fucking me. Two hot dogs, please, I said. The bear reached into the deep fryer with his matted, lice-infested paw, extracted a handful of soggy french fries and jalapeno poppers and plopped them into a paperless plastic basket. He paused his thrusts for the amount of time it took to put himself away and walked to the counter to hand me my meal. The woman glared at me with cold, dead eyes, a palm oil cigarette dangling from her lipstick encrusted mouth. I tried not to look at the fries or taste them as I ate, standing at the counter. There's a rickety plastic picnic table in front of the stand, but I was afraid if I sat down, I'd never get back up again. I'd just sit there forever, eating my poppers and fries. The bear went back over and started screwing the woman again while the boy busied himself with restocking napkins and soda cup lids. I didn't watch them, but I didn't not watch either. White people could be so weird sometimes, I thought to myself, then immediately felt bad for judging. I mean, nobody's perfect, right? Some time went by and I'm somewhere else now, on a swing set on the community playground or sitting on a hill staring up at the sun or back in my motel room, screaming silently in the shower. I don't know whether I'm alive or dead anymore. I'm not sure I fully care. There's a circus in town. News of its impending arrival was cause for great concern among some of the locals. In all the cities the circus stopped in before Bear Creek, strange, horrible events ensued. Mass teen suicides, crime and murder sprees, parades of old men dressed up in women's lingerie, leading to massive pansexual murder orgies in the forests. Blood, milk, and honey spurting from the earth's surface in geysers. Children and animals switching bodies and eating one another. Swarms of rodents, locusts, and frogs. The news of the circus's arrival would trouble me if I had any emotions left anywhere inside me, if I felt anything at all anymore. But I've long since given up on all that. In fact, I welcome any new excitement, anything to jog me out of the pathetic, boring routine I've settled into here. They say the man who leads the circus is a prophet of sorts. They say all who hear the strange words he utters, the sermons delivered in unfamiliar foreign tongues goes mad when they hear him. They say he calls himself the clown. They say he has no sex organs, that he balks when referred to by any pronouns other than it. In Goat Barn, South Dakota, dozens of cheerleaders leapt from a cliff to their deaths after hearing him preach. Similar stories abound from across the country. The ones who survive may have it still worse. They say he takes concubines and servants everywhere he goes, injecting them with a strange demoniacal substance to make them bend to his every whim. Those who refuse his advances suffer the worst fates of all. Gruesome public hangings, immolation rituals, torture, starvation, and madness. Of course, this is all hearsay. I haven't seen the show yet. I'd like to meet this preacher, hear what he has to say. Perhaps he will even allow me to interview him for this paper. Perhaps he's the reason I was drawn to this town in the first place. Maybe I do have a destiny after all. Worst case scenario, he simply destroys me, which wouldn't be so bad. I wonder what Todd would say if he could see me now. Would he be proud of me for chasing my dream all the way to Bear Creek? I miss him so much, even after all that happened between us. But that's another story for another day. Well, folks, I'm off to get myself a hot dog. Until we meet again, travel hounds. Bon voyage, safe travels, and whatever you do, don't forget to write. That was awesome. I, I, I love the Bear Creek concept, like the whole Bear Creek universe. I, I think uh, we've had uh, several people in the past read pieces that were published there. And I'm really like drawn into like the idea of like a shared universe 
that isn't like some sanitized comic book shit, but that's actually like really perverse and bizarre and like, <laughs> I don't know. I, and there were so many great like setting details in this piece. I love the, uh, even like little things like a t the town of like Goat Bar in South Dakota. What a great name for a South Dakota town or the, uh, the hot dog stand that was also a suicide prevention center. Like all of that is just so vivid and hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, it was a great piece. Thanks very much, William. Yeah, thank you so much for reading. Um, next up is Derek and Mr. Bones is still streaming. Yes, hello, Mr. Bones. <laughs> um, hey, Derek, you still with us? I am, can you hear me okay? Um, just a second. I, uh, I, I can hear bone bones is great. Her, her mic is great or his, is it a he or a her? Mic, yeah. Yeah. His mic's good. Yeah. You sound pretty clear. You sound okay. clear. Awesome. Thank you guys as always for having me. I'm trying to pull this up. Is this a work in progress piece? This piece is done. It is, uh, it just has not been published yet. I don't think I've, I don't think I've submitted it anywhere, um, but it is, uh, of course, in my in my um, attempt to read you guys basically my entire novel or collection or whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it um, over the course of a year. It is from that same uh, world and and universe. Gotcha, gotcha. So this is called the Watergate story for now. I work on the top floor of the Watergate in Washington, D.C. as a receptionist at a maritime law firm. I am 24 or 25 at most. I spend most of my day riding the elevators in between smoke breaks. Antoine is my friend who works in the mailroom. You'll meet him soon enough. My apartment is in the basement of a gorgeously gothic little brownstone in Columbia Heights. It doesn't have any windows. I was hospitalized for a time earlier this year. My work sent me a floral arrangement. I told them it was gastrointestinal. I tried to kill myself. It doesn't matter too much. It didn't work, besides. If you tell someone you're having a gastrointestinal issue, there are never any follow-up questions. I've stumbled upon some highly sensitive information in the form of certain documents at the law firm. We'll get to that. But I suspect it could make me a very rich, very wanted man. Today, we're going doctor hunting. I need pills. But first, we stop by my apartment to check on the mattress. We have to make sure the upstairs couple who rent me their basement are still away. They can't discover the mattress. It will cause problems. We're on the bus. There's soon to be a new player in the cruise game between San Francisco Bay and Hawaii. This little nugget alone should be worth millions to the Carnival Corporation. But I have additional details besides. Names and telephone numbers of investors, seed money, a nautical map with curious markings notes from closed session meetings between the attorneys for this new venture and the San Francisco Port Commission, a notarized agreement between an entity and the registered agent in Panama with the words flying under a flag of convenience scribbled in the margins of the document, all of which adds up to some very valuable information. The cruising business is serious business. The barriers to entry are designed to make it both impossible to enter or exit the market. The resulting monopolies are the only way to make money above board or on the deck, as they say. It's true that almost every cruise ship is in the business of transporting stockpiles of exotic weaponry and the daughters of international terrorists fleeing New Haven. These have always been the chief concerns of the below deck, but without a sturdy legal raisonette, the ships become waterlogged mercenary vessels or just very slow moving bulky targets. Governments, foreign and domestic, will not interfere with Harold and Darlene's 40th anniversary cruise celebration. The biggest fear within the cruise industry, internally, and the subject of no less than 60 separate conference calls and international flights for significant face time between 1997 and 1999 was the 1996 publication of Shipping Out in Harper's Magazine later rechristened a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, as the titular story in the 1997 collection of David Foster Wallace's nonfiction, published by Little Brown, obviously, and then again a stir of activity and talk of managing the fallout in the waning days of 2008 following Mr. Wallace's suicide with the 
correct assumption that by erasing his map, as he himself termed it in his fictions, it would lead to an exponential increase in interest in the now dead author's oeuvre, which would have included the scathing indictment of the fun the cruise industry promises yet fails to deliver on each voyage, season after season, year after year, no matter the marketing campaign, no matter the ship's colors or saltwater pool additions, no matter the onboard entertainment, new, never before seen excursions to CIA islands, and that this negative publicity publicity would filter through to the academies, coastal elites, literary types, and homosexuals, eventually infiltrating the heartland, that bastion of their customer base, so starved for open waters. Lose the cover, lose the cover. You know what I'm saying? The freshly piss stained mattress filled up the whole front stoop, unfortunately fully shaded. The pills are for, I feel sometimes fine and sometimes want to watch basketball, have sex, be cool, normal, fun, get good at barbecuing guy, but sometimes I feel sad and get nervous, get more nervous. The first doctor said I had a history of, the second doctor asked me to go to a therapist first. So before we go to the doctor, doctor for pills, we got to go to the therapist and that's happening today. What's happening today with the therapist is it turns out he's a sex therapist. I don't want to talk to the sex therapist. Just to get the okay, to get the pills I needed, I did mention casually, actually just sort of joking, knowing the line of work the man was in, and God, what he'd probably heard even just that morning before 11 a.m., that I could only come in the daytime. My cum was afraid of the dark. Yeah. He had never heard of it. He said that I needed to see a psychiatrist, which in fairness was where the fuck I thought I was. Freak we're skipping that bullshit today and heading straight to the cash doctor. The cash doctor always had a line out the door, two benches out front. If you were lucky, you spent the hour sitting instead of standing. Pets were allowed. Cash doctor sees me at three. Antoine told me about him. I told you you'd meet him later. We're not really friends. I don't think he likes me. I don't think anyone likes me. I wish I couldn't feel like that. I know it's not true and it's just a stupid thing to think and that hurts me even more because I'm obsessing over it like death when it's not even an issue at the moment but we sometimes smoke cigarettes together out front in the breezeway. When I run out, I ask for one of his. When he runs out, he asks for one of mine. You show me yours, I show you mine, I once said, and then said, ha ha, and bounced my head back and forth so that it was clear I was joking. But he told me, not using his words, that he didn't find that funny. I liked giving him cigarettes. I could have done that all day. He was goofy sexy. I hated when I had to have one of his. Menthols, long, like my mom's. I missed my mom then. I didn't feel so good about myself. I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin if I'm just laying it out there and being honest. It really was a nice treat standing in that breezeway, leaning against the silver railing, smoking, talking hoops. Oh, look, the cash doctor's assistant finally called me. Let's go inside. I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to blackmail the company. I don't know what most of that stuff means. I Googled shipping terms. I love my wife and my daughter and my son. I write for them. They may see a grotesque father or an egotistical husband, but these were the places I could shed all the nasty parts of myself, all of the id and give and receive love, always distrusting I deserved it, but without fear of bringing shame. I sit out front and answer the telephones. Sometimes people come up and ask me, where did Richard Nixon stay? And I say, he didn't stay here. And one of them nudges the other on the elbow and says to the other, I knew it was baloney. And one of them would say, well, then what is it then? All perturbed and I'd whisper, a conspiracy. <laughs> and truth be told, that's what it was like working on the top floor of the Watergate building for a maritime law firm as a receptionist, I love you. It cost $100 for a 30-day supply of Klonopin 1 milligram in DC from the cash doctor in 2009. That was great. <laughs> I, all, of the, all of the cruise industry conspiracy shit was so funny. <laughs> just, I just, I don't know. I love like the insinuation that there's something insidious going on behind, beneath something like so boring and mundane, right? 
And there just has to be, right, though? I mean, you make a really compelling case, to be honest, because how, like, there can't possibly be enough people who want to go on fucking cruises to actually no. support that industry. There's no way, right? Because, like, it's clear. That's the thing about that essay is that what makes it so relatable in that David Foster Wallace piece is that, of course, cruising is miserable. Like, it, you know what I mean? Like, why yeah. would you expect it to be anything other than? It seems I think it's got to do with what <laughs> <laughs> gotta be like that's how we get our shit to like iran or whatever right right no i 100 percent buy that that's my new um cruise head cannon <laughs> awesome thank you thanks so much for reading Derek. uh gabriel you're up next and this is actually another piece that was just published in bear creek right yeah it's um it was really cool i was talking to unity the other day when when the new issue dropped and I feel like our pieces kind of eclipsed a, a little bit. I think Bear Creek just kind of brings this certain thing out in people. But yeah, I, it's, um, yeah, definitely the same, you know, I thought for a second, it's like, oh, it's like the same girl with amnesia, but yeah, I don't know. I'll, without further ado. So the mythology behind this is that it's a found, a found letter that I turned into Bear Creek as a concerned citizen. Um, here we go. Dear Diana Ranswell, this is going to sound strange and please don't take it the wrong way, but you know how people sometimes will start their letters with, I hope this gets to you safely? Well, I hope this letter doesn't get to you at all. Let me explain. God, I really hope you don't have to end up reading this and I could just tell you about it in person. And if anyone should read this before my mother, may this letter serve as my alibi for this gruesome scene I regret you had to see here. First of all, mom, I just want you to know that you were totally right about Corey. I should have listened to you all along and now I'm paying the price, praying to make it out of this. I'm lying here somewhere just outside of Bear Creek, getting slowly baked by the sun. I'm not sure where exactly. We are looking to get out into the middle of nowhere, but every time I said, what about here? This looks good. He just kept driving. But that's the thing. Now I am in the middle of nowhere and Corey is dead five feet away from me. I'm wearing nothing but my jean shorts and cowboy boots because I have my t-shirt soaking up all the blood I'm losing out of my leg. I did wear a bra, but I had to tie it around my thigh to make a tourniquet because Corey is such a bad shot. Can you believe he did this? I know for a fact he's never shot a gun before. Now look. Sorry, I forgot you can't. And I hope you won't. And I hope the next time you see me, I'll have just a limp and a tragic story to tell because I swear to God I'm never coming out here again. I had a feeling Corey was taking me on a trip to propose to me. That's why I didn't tell you where I was going, because I knew you never liked him. It pains me to realize it's been three months since you and I have talked. I'm so sorry, Mom. Him and I have had a lot of those now or never talks lately. And when I say him and I, it was more like him just saying it's now or never over and over. So preparing myself for him to pop the question, I had written a poem for him in my journal here to let him down easy, to let him know I loved him, but there were too many things that made me nervous about spending the rest of my life with him. I thought it was weird that he didn't bring water if he knew we were going on a hike. He brought that fucking acoustic guitar instead. He just kept walking ahead of me singing that sad song, Nothing by Towns Van Zandt. This should have been the first red flag. He wasn't even singing it to me, but I guess in a way he was. He was being so secretive about what we were doing or where we were even going. I just let him do his thing because I thought he was being romantic, mysterious, you know? That's why I fell in love with him. Enough to even listen to him when he demanded we leave our cell phones in the car. To unplug and be present, he said. But I didn't feel scared until I realized how thirsty I was. Until I saw that we were way the fuck out here. I couldn't see the road anymore. But I guess he knew it would take all the water in the world when he'd be burning in hell. So why bother with any at all? But the thing is, Mom, I think I'm in hell as well. Only I'm wide awake. I just don't know what I did to deserve this. All I said was no. Then I panicked and told him I'd think about it because he started to get angry. That's when he took out his gun. Mom, I was thinking about you when I told him no. I just want you to know that. But saying I had to think about it wasn't even good enough for him, of course. 
because he preferred that I don't think. He never liked that I had a mind of my own, and you saw that. Thank you, Mom, even if it's too late. He thought he had it all planned out. If I said no, which I pretty much did, he would kill me, then kill himself. We started that morning at a bar. He just kept ordering shots with his beards. Ugh, he was drinking that disgusting peanut butter flavored whiskey nobody likes and now I can't get that taste out of my mind. He kissed me on the way out, his tongue the last thing in my mouth. He was still wasted when we started the hike and I was just buzzed enough to fail seeing something was a little off. I can see now that he needed liquid courage to follow through with all of this. But what a fucking moron. As if I wouldn't start running when he raised the gun up at me. So I ran and he just shot me once. Got me in the back of my thigh, luckily. But mom, it's taking every ounce of me to not think that maybe I would have just been luckier if he had just killed me quick instead of me just slowly baking and bleeding to death out here. Mom, more than anything, I wish I could, I wish I could say that that was all, but there's more. About 10 minutes after Corey blew his brains out, I heard something that sounded like motorcycles. I was relieved it was some locals out here that heard the gunshot, so I started screaming for help so they would know where to go because I'm on my back here hidden behind a big rock pile that looked just like all the other ones. They found me. It was three guys, maybe in their 20s, riding those white trash ATVs. I started crying harder, just so relieved, but then they started laughing, mom, like howling as if it was a joke. They were so drunk they could barely stand. They stumbled over to Corey and just started poking at him at the hole in his head. Holy John F. Kennedy, yep, he's dead, cold fucking corpse, one of them said, cracking up, while another one came and grabbed my chest. Well, this one is nice and warm, he yelled, all fucking excited. He, kneel he kneeled over to me, just repeating that, saying I was nice and warm. I screamed as loud as I could. I uncrossed my arms just so I could reach into the back of my shorts where I was hiding Corey's gun, which I grabbed just in case some coyotes or bears, bears smelled all this blood. I shoved it in the guy's mouth and blew his brains out, Mom. Your daughter is now a murderer. How do you like that? But not just once, three times, because the other two ran over to do God knows what to me, so I just shot them too. I guess this means I'm a better shot than Corey. A girl's got to do what a girl's got to do, right? I remember how much you loved that song when I was a kid. What would you have done, Mom? So I have Corey's dead body five feet from my head and these three like deliverance motherfuckers spread like a pitchfork at my feet, but kind of angled out. So if I'm lucky enough to get a search helicopter overhead, they're gonna see five people lying in the shape of a fucking peace sign. I just pray they don't think we're some hippies trying to be cute out here. My only saving grace is that I see the sun is finally going down, but that also means that it's going to get cold. I can already feel my sunburnt skin throbbing with the temperature change. I'm thinking that someone has to come looking for these three guys, but it's my fault they never went home today, that they're never going home again. But if their family or friends do show up, how are they gonna believe me when I tell them what really happened? They might just try to kill me anyway once they see they're all dead. I guess that's why I'm writing this, so there will be no mystery. I just checked the magazine in this 45 and there's two bullets left. I hate to think of what I might have to do with them. I'm so fucking hungry I can't even tell you. I didn't eat breakfast when I could have. I sort of lost my appetite at the bar because I saw how Corey was getting, but now I could eat anything. I'm scared to close my eyes, but I don't know what else to do than try to sleep to speed up the chances of someone finding me. Us, I guess. Also, if I'm sleeping, I won't be hungry, right? Mom, I'm so sorry for what I'm about to tell you. I hope one day you can see me as the same daughter you had before we stopped talking, before I found myself in these depths of unspeakable depravity. Unspeakable because I vowed to never discuss aloud what I have just done, but I needed to document just how bad it has gotten out here. Writing in my journals has always made me, no, makes me feel better, no matter how tough life gets. So I can only hope these next few paragraphs will prove some semblance of catharsis, at the least, mirror back to me the shock of what has happened to keep my blood flowing because now it's getting freezing. I'm curled up in fetal position, wearing Corey's jacket as I write this. So I managed to get some sleep at least, but I'm not sure how long because time has become very abstract here. I woke up 
not just because I was shivering. I felt a hunger, an emptiness that quickly became a nauseating pain that nearly rivaled my gunshot wound. I looked at Corey, wondering what's the point of wearing so many layers when you're dead? Earlier today, I thought it was stupid. He was wearing his fringe suede jacket in 112 degree heat, but now I'm so grateful that he did. I managed to get the strength to scoop myself up to him. I took a long, it took a long time, but I was able to position his arms up in order to slip the jacket right off. It's a big jacket, so it actually covers some of my wound as well. I stopped shivering for a while, but then I did something that made me start to panic, and now I can't tell if I'm shaking because I'm cold or because of the thought of what I have done. Before I slipped the jacket off Corey, I looked at his face. The moon was shining bright enough where I could make out his features. Finally, he looked at rest. Lovingly, I touched his head. I guess to sort of say my last goodbye. My hand went into his exit wound, and I saw about a quarter of his skull was blown off. It was moist, all blood and brain, so my hand got all covered in Corey. Before I could reason how or why, my hand just white, went right to my tongue. I licked the blood off. It ignited my hunger and was also quenching my thirst. Before I knew it, I just kept going until my hand was clean. But I know I will never truly be clean again. I went back for more, somehow having the courage to chew. I found some of what I think was his brain matter, making sure there was no hair in it. I just went right, it just went right into my mouth, mom. I nibbled at first, just to see if I could handle the taste. It went right down, easier than I thought, little by little. Before I knew it, my hand was going in for seconds. I was able to keep it down too, and the pain in my stomach went away. Corey made me try tacos de sesos once, even though it was the last thing I wanted to do at the time. So this isn't much different, I guess. His dead body isn't doing any good, just lying there attracting flies. So I guess a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. That's all I got for now, mom. See you soon, I hope. Love always, Alicia. That was amazing. That's so bleak, so bleak. I, I love the way this piece flows, though, because I think it, it, it ends in a, like, it ends in a place of such disgusting darkness, but it takes its time getting there, and it gets there in a way that makes you understand exactly why she made the choices she made, right? And in a way that doesn't end up seeming like an easy gross out moment or an easy moment of like exploitation or something. You right, right. How agonizing it is to be stuck in that position and to realize like instinctually that this is the only thing you can do. And I don't know, it, it's so vicious. I love it. It's awesome. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you, Gabriel. Um, Dante. Uh, you are up next. You're still with us. I see him in the. Um... Uh, I see. I see you talking, Dante, but I can't hear you. Oh, uh, your mic's muted, Dante. Okay. Oh, Is there we better? are. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. So this is a, uh, is this a work in progress short story? Um, I haven't submitted it yet, so I'll, I'll probably tweak it a little bit before I do. Um, but beyond that, it's mostly done. Awesome. Well, okay. Mike's all yours. <laughs> all right. Roll call. My wife left and took everything. Before she walked out, she flushed my phone down the toilet broke my computer into pieces with a hammer and tried to flush the pieces in the hammer down the toilet, which broke the toilet. That was okay. There was a toilet in the garage that worked. She took all the furniture except for one dining room chair and the bed, which she lit on fire. Half of it burned before I could put it out. She took all the art off the walls, which I wouldn't miss, and smashed all the pictures of her and I together and burnt the photos. The broken glass was everywhere. The soles of my feet were covered in tiny cuts. She took the pots, pans, and silverware. That was okay. I only needed the microwave. I had to go to Device World to get a new phone. It wasn't until I took it out of the box that I realized that all my old contacts had also been flushed down the toilet. I had no idea what to do with myself. I was so lonely. The loneliness demanded I get revenge on my wife, so I went to install Let's Do It on my new device. I couldn't find Let's Do It. 
I also couldn't find let's argue, let's look, or let's joke. A coworker explained that while I was away in my married fantasy world, Let's Incorporated was bought out by a company called Roll Call. Roll Call swallowed Let's Do It, Let's Joke, and Let's Argue and consolidated them all into a new platform called Roll Call. Roll Call was the only game in town and had no competition, so I installed it. In Roll Call, you couldn't say anything. You couldn't like or love or laugh at anything. You couldn't post pictures or jokes or flirt or argue. All you could do is log in and hit a button that said, here. If you were lucky, other users would hit a button next to your profile picture that said, acknowledge. When that happened, you would get a scene point. When you saw someone else log in and hit here, you could hit acknowledge. That was it. That was all you could do. I tried it for an hour and decided it was a stupid waste of time. I went to a bar and everyone ignored me. I got drunk, came home, stepped in broken glass again, and passed out on the half-burnt bed. The next day I told a coworker what a stupid waste of time roll call was. You can't even say anything. You can't talk to anyone. You can't like anything, I said. Somebody's can, he said. He was actually using roll call as he spoke. It was our lunch break. He said that somebody's were roll call users that had been acknowledged by other users so many times that they had achieved somebody status, allowing them to post brief messages. He said a roll call user can't even see somebody's or their messages and tell her until he or she has acknowledged 10,000 logins from other users. That still sounds like a waste of time, I said. He shrugged and said, whatever, then went back to roll calling. I went home depressed and cut my foot again. I opened a beer and looked at the soles of my feet. Tiny shards of glass were lodged deep in the cuts and they were infected. I went in the bathroom, sat on the broken toilet and poured rubbing alcohol over my foot. The alcohol blood and pus hit the side of the tub and cascaded all over the bathroom floor. I went into the bedroom, sit down on the half-burnt bed and looked at a picture of my wife that she had forgotten to take. Her phone number was the only one I still had memorized. I called her, but she didn't answer. I cried. Later that week, the divorce papers arrived in the mail and I cried some more. The room grew dark as I lay curled up, sobbing on the charred bed. I awoke to an exciting new sound on my new phone. The room was all lit up from the screen, but all it was was an alert that a child had been kidnapped. I went to the kitchen, opened a beer and opened a roll call. The row of faces appeared with the words here and acknowledge next to each one. I pressed the here button that showed other users that I was logged in and ready to roll call. I waited, nothing happened. So I pressed acknowledge next to the prettiest face. The face disappeared. I went to acknowledge another user's login but they disappeared before I could press acknowledge. Another face appeared along with here. I went to acknowledge but was again too slow. I sat up, stretched out my neck and arms and focused. All night I hit acknowledge and got faster and faster. My acknowledge counter now said 854. That's how many times I'd successfully hit acknowledge. It didn't seem like anyone had acknowledged me yet, but I was too inexperienced to be sure. The clock said 4 a.m. I was wide awake but exhausted. I put my phone down and tried to sleep. My mind was wired, but I finally fell asleep for a few hours. All my dreams were about roll call. The next day at work, I racked up 2,000 more acknowledges. I logged on at lunch and during the breaks. I took extra bathroom breaks so I could roll call in the stall. Everyone around me was roll calling too. It was exciting. The infected cuts on my feet hurt. When I walked, it felt like a shard of glass was pressing right against a nerve inning and I had to limp. That night, I brought my acknowledge rate up to 5,000. My wrist began to stiffen and, I, and get sore, so I took some ibuprofen and kept at it. I had to see what would happen when I got to 10,000 acknowledges. The next, day I got, the next day at work, I got written up for my recent subpar performance, but I didn't care. That night I reached 10,000 acknowledges. Immediately the screen began to blink and the whole interface rearranged itself. It was now more colorful and the faces became better looking. The faces on the top had short messages next to them. The messages were all in the current slang. I didn't understand a lot of it and had to look it up on how to talk, but I was overjoyed. I felt like I was inching closer to the inner circle of an exclusive club. My wrist, forearms and feet throbbed. The next day I told my coworker about my accomplishment. Nice, he said without looking up. What happens next? Keep acknowledging. Then what? Well, now other roll callers can find you. Not many, only the ones who scroll all the way down to the bottom, but at least you're not invisible anymore. Yeah? So every time someone acknowledges you, you get a scene point. If a somebody acknowledges you, you get 10,000 scene points, but that's not gonna happen. So I just wait? No, just keep acknowledging. 
The more you acknowledge, the further up you'll be and the less they'll have to scroll to find you. That makes it more likely you'll get seen. One more thing, I can't really understand some of the messages. It's all in new slang. Some of it's not even on how to talk. Yeah, I'm not surprised that you don't understand. You kind of talk old fashioned. I use some slang, I said. Yeah, but most of it's not new. I'm gonna start using all, all new slang soon. Really? Yep. Even some buddies can't just post whatever they want. It has to be an all new slang. I'm gonna go to a new slang workshop retreat next weekend. Why doesn't roll call just translate the messages into new slang? Because then anyone could post, that would suck. After work, I went to a bar and roll called for hours. After a few days, my wrist muscles were so sore and weak that I couldn't type and had to switch to voice dictation. I just limped around the house saying, acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge. I was in the zone. Time stood still. I finally felt like I had a reason to be. It used to be that when work was over, I felt like nothing. There was no way to make the night go by fast enough. Now I felt like I had a real aim in life. Acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge. I fell asleep roll calling. I was awoken by a new sound and a new light. I looked at my device. A happiness I had never thought possible took hold of me. Someone had acknowledged me. I started to jump up and down on my half burnt bed, but the pain in my feet forced me to stop. I picked up my phone and resumed acknowledging with a newfound zeal. The more I acknowledged, the more I was seen. It was spiritual. When you think about it, it's just like life, right? Just like the universe. If you want to be acknowledged, then you have to acknowledge others. Roll call is an intensely spiritual activity. Despite my limp from my swollen bloody feet, there was a new spring in my step. But it was getting harder to do my job because my wrist and forearms were so sore and stiff. As I racked up the acknowledges and the seams, I started worrying that I was unprepared for life as a somebody. Not that I had any doubt that I would be a somebody. My life now depended on it. But when that happened, would I have anything to say? I didn't know all the new slang. I mostly knew older slang, and that wasn't going to cut it. I couldn't afford the retreat, so I enrolled in an internet new slang class. There were two teachers, a muscular man and a pretty yoga teacher. They completed each other's sentences and sometimes spoke in unison. Welcome to the new slang. If you're here, then you're ready to make a change in your life. Congratulations. The universe rewards those who take big step. And the step you're about to take is giant. You probably thought that adopting a new slang word here and there was enough, and maybe at one point it was, but in today's world, it's all or nothing. In fact, it's painful for us to be speaking this way without any new or even old slang. So that everyone has an equal chance, we begin the first lesson without any slang, but before long, the entire course will be taught completely in new slang. We believe in a full immersion approach. Like we said, it's all or nothing. When new slang is introduced, whatever it is, we go all in and we demand that you go all in. When we update our slang, we actually force ourselves to forget we used to talk, how we used to talk. How is that possible, you say? We didn't think it was possible either, but with practice, forgetting your old vocabulary so you can make room for all new slang is a skill that anybody can learn. Every day I would take new slang lessons and practice what I learned in the shattered mirror. The rest of the night I roll called and every night I dreamt of roll call. It was all I wanted to do. I was prescribed antibiotics for my infected feet. I was finally making something of myself. I knew that my wife would regret her decision to leave me when she saw me as a somebody up there. She wouldn't even knew, know what the hell I was talking about because she would still be speaking in the old vocabulary. Then she would know she was a nobody. Acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledge. I finally learned the new slang for acknowledge. Ignoles, ignoles, ignoles. Later it changed to knolls, 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 and then oles, oles, oles. I finally, I finally forced myself to not get attached to any one way of saying acknowledge or anything else. I intended to keep up. I intended to be a somebody. I now had to wear an arm and a wrist brace. I was getting closer and closer to being a somebody. I was even starting to understand a lot of the messages that the somebody's posted without having to consult how to talk. They usually said things like, I like my new car, or I prefer warm, sunny weather. Or, I like it when a song I recognize comes on and other people recognize it too. Or, that feeling when you open roll call in the AM and have thousands of new ignals. But it was of course always in new slang. One day I realized that I never saw any celebrities on roll call. I asked my coworker about this. Celebrities don't play roll call, he said. Someone else said, yes they do. They just have their own level that only other celebrities can play. But only somebody's can be celebrities, a third person said. 
I was extremely disappointed, but not for long. It was a simple decision. I had to become a celebrity too. I would not only be a somebody, I would be a celebrity. Ignoles, 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 ignoles. God damn, I was on fire. I was now getting hundreds of ignoles a day. I had to get surgery on my wrist and forearm, which felt like a little bit of a setback, but I was able to keep up with the new, with the new slang lessons and thank God for voice dictation. Surgery was actually a blessing in disguise because I was able to take off two paid weeks, two paid weeks to recuperate. During those two weeks, all I did was play roll call and study new slang. I skipped all my physical therapy sessions. I didn't have time for them. The new slang lessons were already cutting into my roll call time. I panicked when I realized I would probably become a somebody on possibly the exact same day that I was supposed to go back to work. But if I was a somebody, would I still have to go to my stupid old job? Did somebody's have to work? I didn't think so, but I also didn't have time to worry about it. I tore through the ignoles. Roll call really drained the batteries on my advice, and I was now racking up so many ignoles and scenes that my phone had to be plugged in at all the time. It was always hot to the touch. The day, the day that I knew I would become a somebody, my device went blank and wouldn't come back on. I screamed and kicked a hole in my wall. I threw the chair through the window. I kicked the front door so many times that the doorknob broke. The police came, but I didn't care because I was about to be a somebody. When the, phone, when the cops finally left, I took my phone to the Einstein counter at Device World and the Einstein said that it had to be replaced. I dished out the money and used voice dictation to roll call on the drive home. I was racing against the clock. I had to be a somebody before it was time to go back to work. That way I wouldn't have to go back to work and that way I wouldn't get evicted. The front door would no longer open so I came through the hole that I'd smashed in the window. Oles, 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 oles. I learned to love how I could never get used to saying anything in any certain way. I loved how the new slang was always changing and I never got bored. In fact, the problem is that I started to get bored with the new slang instantly. I always wanted there to be a new way to say the same thing. I really only had three or four things to say, so if I couldn't say them in a new way every week, I felt empty. At five in the morning, I became a somebody. I cried tears of joy. It was hard to see exactly what was going on through my tears, but once again, the entire screen changed. There was a flashing cursor. I typed in a J and a J appeared. I realized I could say anything I wanted to. What should I say? I didn't want it to be too weird. I didn't want to become a nobody again. I had heard of somebody's being demoted to nobodies for saying things that were so weird that even nobody shouldn't have to hear them. So I said, grateful to be a somebody and hit post. My phone erupted into scenes as thousands of people acknowledged my post. Life was better than I ever thought possible. But there was more. Little red numbers appeared up on the right. I clicked them. A new screen opened. Other somebodies were inviting me to the event. I looked at the event details. It said that everybody was going to the sports game, then to the protest, then to the concert. I skipped work. I ignored the phone when it rang. I couldn't stop acknowledging now. This was not the time to coast on past achievements. There are somebodies and then there are somebodies. If you want the finer things in life, you can't let yourself get soft. I got ready to go to the event. From this point on, it was all we and no me. Somebody's didn't become somebody's by being self-centered. Somebody's acknowledged each other. Somebody's stuck together. We went to the sports game and cheered. There was winning and all 20,000 of us left together as one. We left as everybody. Next, we went to the concert to watch the best-selling pop artist of all time. We were so happy that we got to hear and sing along to songs that we all recognized. We all left the concert together and went to the protest. Our sign said, resist. I really love this slogan because I once studied electronics and I liked that the protest wasn't telling the bad thing to stop. We were just telling it to slow down like electricity through a wire, way less harsh. That night when I was crawling back into the house through the hole in my window, I slipped and gashed open my forearm on a giant shard of glass. The blood got everywhere, seeped into my phone and froze up the screen, but not before I was able to post one more message as a somebody. That message was resist. It was hard to sleep knowing that my message was getting acknowledged without my being able to see it. I crawled into bed and wrapped the top sheet around my forearm to stop the flow of blood. It made a huge mess, but nothing could bring me down. Will I ever get to be a celebrity? Of course I will. And when I do, I will have mastered all the new slang. In the meantime, I will stay humble, continue to work on my roll call game, and continue to acknowledge the existence of my fellow roll call users. Oles, 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 oles. That was amazing. That was so good. Thanks. <laughs> such a, like, that was such a, like, effective critique of, like, 
social media addiction and the like pathological perverse incentives that are in place. The one thing I really liked though was like the physical toll that it had on the character. Like so many pieces about like the dangers of technology or the dangers of like getting sucked into the internet world like forget about like the physical being of the individual right and this mm -hmm. one like every stupid choice this guy makes the more addicted he becomes the more intense the actual physical pain associated with it is and i think like <laughs> there's a real truth to that as someone who like has like been holding my phone and realized like oh shit like my fucking arm is numb what why yeah. like why haven't i put it down yet right yeah but yeah no that was fantastic thank you i really appreciate it sorry if it was on the long side oh no no that was great and it seems like everyone in the chat really enjoyed it too so yeah thank you so much for reading oh thank you for having me i'm really enjoying it um Next up, we have Rudy and Michael. Rudy, do you mind if I put Michael next and then you can follow him? Yeah, absolutely. Cool, cool. Because I think you might be screen sharing or something for your piece, or? Uh, might be, probably. Might be. Okay. Maybe not, not sure though. Uh, Michael. Cool. Um, yeah, let me get my thing up here. All right. Are you, you guys reading more from the novel you've been reading from the last couple? No, I, I am a little behind on my editing, um, but I'm reading something that I wrote uh, cool. last weekend. Um, shout out to Derek Main for providing some very critical feedback on this. Derek. Uh, definitely helped make it a lot better. Is, are people able to get in that link I just made? I think works there for me go. i see people coming in cool all right i will just uh all right this piece is called seasons my family has decided nana needs to move her water system heating pipes all busted she's refused aid for months her home a rebel fort on the verge of surrender my uncle says she's gone in the head he illustrates his point with grilled chicken speared on a fork and jabbed in my direction like it's some life lesson I'm expected to learn after he slept four winters on the couch in the den. Nana will live with us and sleep upstairs, the working plan goes. I shove food north to south on my plate, observe the summer through bay windows, too dry for the grass to stay green. Nobody has enough water, I want to scream. I know why Nan is not leaving, but it feels useless to speak about the cat bones whispering in her garden. The fingernail scars on the floorboards from blood ties I'll never know. Nora, schizophrenic second cousin, flown from the roof at 17. Photos confirm our likeness, right down to the evasiveness of our stares, the bags beneath our eyes. What you don't see is the crackling skin, the sun and moon and Holy Spirit shared in deep-eyed silences our conclave curse, the genetics of commonality multiplied by chance. Nana stays to guard the afterimages, echoes of Nora, my aunt who died as an infant, my grandfather heart struck before I was born. The life they built together is still worth protecting. But that's not polite conversation here at the Oaken family table. My pills in the cabinet and their smartphone finger, smartphone's fingers away from reflex, that's enough, enough. Mealtime ends. My uncle stands as the trees outside blaze red and orange, autumnal invasions of leafy cells. Let's just go get her, he barks at me. By the time he's done pissing and we reach the car, encroaching winter has shorn the trees bare. Nobody has time to rake anymore. Two clicks across Monford, past the unfinished elementary school, classrooms full of brick and mortar unwilling to learn. Snow smeared roads, my uncle slipping, his wheels or his feet, I'm not sure whichever got him here first. Nana's place is right on the corner where the highway meets the morning commute. A house front rebuilt four times, each time wrecked and sundered by four wheels and a drunk's demonic fury. Insurance always obliged in those days, Nana says. It's not yet springtime when we park, sure, warm enough in the sun, but I brought a coat for the last of the storms. Uncle knocks, Nana opens the door, gray mane in baby blue rollers, televangelism's comfort shouting from the bedroom. Just inside the door is a powder pink couch sealed in plastic, a relic of the past that hasn't tasted oxygen in 50 years, priceless encapsulation. 
Uncle says, let's go, and Nana looks at me, her eyes complete strangers, reflecting a phantom as spring bursts from every branch and flowers roars wide open, demand to be plucked and carried away. And now she screams, get the fuck out, over and over in a voice I do not know. My grandmother, blood love, more Buddhist than Catholic, a life carved by psychic wounds, and no, this isn't bullshit. Family legend holds that one July when my grandfather was shot in the war, she crumpled on Monfort Common and bled for five straight days from her fingers. Now we're the enemy. Nana's fists like lion-headed hammers bashing us back, back into the summer sun and the blistered stones on the front walk. The following spring, my mother succeeds where my uncle failed. She moves in, sleeps upstairs outside my bedroom in a small futon bed at the intersection of everything. The family won't sell Nana's house, but the jewelry and fine furniture is boxed and sealed out of reach. One mausoleum traded for another. Finer stone, American, locally quarried. I haven't stopped shaking. Each morning, her cat mules at my door until I let her in so she can sit beside me and pad my face, desirous of connection, saying something I won't understand, always calling to me from behind the one door I can't open, not in this life. My hand traces the cat's bone-studded spine, drinking the warmth from Nora's fur. That's it. Oh, wow. That was fucking beautiful. As someone um, who comes from a family with a lot of mental illness, I really, really strongly felt a lot of the beginning of that story. Like that, like, weird sense that, like, that, like, your mental, that, that, like, your schizophrenia or your depression or your whatever is, like, a function of your family connections, just as much as it's a function of like genetics or environment or anything else. And you know, it's just like beautifully poetically written as well. Just a wonderful piece. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that's um, sort of part of like a amorphous body of work exploring my mother's side of the family, which is like very fractured and like under it's, there's a lot of weird shorn branches of the family tree and you know recently getting into that so no i appreciate uh thanks for giving me the chance to read it yeah absolutely the piece that you read a few weeks ago about um the funeral piece was that related to this piece in any way um not part of this sort of like amorphous project but it is sort of just like unpacking my northeastern catholic family gotcha. um, if i ever put these together they may wind up in the same thing possibly gotcha. but um but yeah okay. well thank you so much for reading thank you uh rudy so rudy what the hell do you have planned for us <laughs> oh rudy are you still with us oh hey yeah sorry okay. um so um i have a couple or a few uh flash question mark poetry pieces i guess um, but before I read them, I want to, and before I link to them, uh, I want, <laughs> that's all right. Um, before, I, before I read them though, I want to say, um, just a wanna... little bit about how they're, they were made. Yeah, cool. Um, I was going to ask you about that. Okay, so these, these flash pieces, they were basically made with a constrained writing tool that I created. And uh, the way the tool works is it imposes kind of a different rule for each letter of the alphabet used to, used to start words. So the rules are themed around uh, super villains that I've come up with. So, and each villain is represented by a letter in the alphabet. Um, the tool itself kind of started as a joke about a piece of writing advice that I see kind of frequently on Twitter, which is that you should let your characters grow beyond your control or you should let them write themselves. And I basically thought at first like lol, but also <laughs> I think that I kind of admire people who can do that and kind of wanted to make a literal imagination game uh, for myself where I can just chill with my characters and write kind of. Um, and the way the tool works is you gradually build up constraints with each sentence, um, which um, each, uh, each glyph in the alphabet represents a different character. And when the sentence ends, all the shit is reset. So it's very, um, I guess it's very slow going as far as getting any, uh, getting anything down 
But uh, if I don't want a character's rules to affect the writing, uh, because each one has a very different rule that like can kind of constrains how the piece has to be written, then I can right click on them and uh, I can what, what's called golden ruling them, um, which removes the rule from play. But when I do that, it means that I either have to integrate them into the story somehow. And that's something that I do in the Wadsworth, or the the, the Wad author piece, um, or I have to basically give them Tulpa status in my head for the duration of the piece and take their criticisms into account. Uh, so I'm literally sitting there talking to myself, uh, which is what I do in the Willie Beamish piece. Uh, so most of these stories are very much kind of auto fictiony, uh, which is a change from what I normally do. Uh, and the main reason I decided to use my super villain concepts as a touchstone for them. Uh, it's because a lot of them are really like personal and I feel like connecting that stuff to autobiographical or autofictional type writing could kind of produce some interesting stuff for me. So that's where it's at. And uh, so just to summarize a little bit, what you're doing here is each letter in the alphabet alphabet is alphabet. <laughs> each letter <laughs> in the alphabet is assigned to a different fictional supervillain, right? Fictional character, And yep. whenever you use one of those letters to start a word, it adds rules that you need to follow as you write. For writing, yep, that's correct. Um, and you can like nullify those rules, but only by making that supervillain a character in the story, that's or right. by like allowing it to become like a quote unquote authorial voice, right? Like giving it right. like, increased power over how you write. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And these are all, um, these these stories are all based on myself, so they're all kind of true. Um, but uh, these in particular are based on kind of my relationship with church and uh, my antagonistic relationship with church uh, and religion, uh, particularly the church in my own town, uh, which I uh, kind of went nuts and trashed when I was like 20 years old. I went in there and destroyed a bunch of shit. And so that's kind of what, the first one is based on. Also, this document has some kind of multimedia components that you can pull up as you read along if you want to. But with that said, I'll, and also these are screenshots from the program. I can show the program later on, but I won't do that right now. I'll just, uh, I'll just read it out here. All right, I'll get started. Even the younglings, 200% chucked all marbles, tilt, when I selected suicide by Skywalker. Sunday morning. Soldiers blinking between were mocked and were mocked and why ma goose stepping gaily behind age inverted me. 21 and 12 together and boy am I sorry to Clark's surname I guess. I am. And selfishness is a space station suspiciously circular around this suicidal buck. Blue saber ignited in Sunday school halls. Fling the shit. Swing at myself. Everyone. And cops don't kill. Dun, dun, dun. Wah, wah, wah. Anakin spent a week submerged. Robo symbiosis. And I spent two weeks institutionalized. Was it worth it? Dispelling force ghosts. Father's heart. The ender offends answered. Are you certain? Absolutely. Wad author. Hexen level editor. Wads were authored by Electric Light Bulb Man. Wadsworth Longfellow, a fellow creative. Long fucking assignment, Addison Wesley. Fellow recursion, my Sunday afternoon after church force boners. Drost. Faggot fellow, fellow faggot enters faggot fellow's eye, enters rhomboid encompassing fellow faggot. Inner stage right, a British faggot fagging away, arranging faggots. Exhaling fag biocides because the queen. Two between eyes, two to a neck, messy mar of e fucking gads. Recursion Johnson watches fag fellow bleeding, writhing, red shifting with 2005 2012 feels. Willie Beamish. Mom says it's bedtime. So I close dominant species without beating my current level and beam into my bed and beat myself, Willie Beamish. Anxiety about Meisman's Earth Science class, where I'm circled by brighter stars, and 
learned about quantum entanglement yet. Eric hasn't done it yet, but I wish I could just keep da 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 Squee! Masturbating mostly queerly. It's mostly queer stretches, he does. And health class suggests stretching. Fuck public school and everyone inside, says my Cyrix 200 megahertz mine, while cum dries and morning fear is cue. Soviet soldier is in a conga line to fuck self-esteem holes. Rim. And that's all that I have for that. That, I love these. I love how dense they are. This is such a really, like, this is such a wild way to write what's basically prose poetry, right? Like, like, I like the, I, I, I've always liked stream of consciousness style writing, but there is a point where it, you like, when you have that amount of like freedom or when you try to transcribe your thoughts, you can kind of like lose the thread or whatever. And I love the idea of adding constraints that kind of force you that like kind of narrow your ability to write while still writing in that kind of stream of consciousness style. I know it's such a great idea. I'm going to have to, <laughs> you'll have, when you have the program ready, you should, we should share it on the website or something so other people can. Yeah. Um, it. It's actually, it's done. It's fully complete with all the, uh, all the letters and stuff like that. There are a few bugs, but, and it's a little you know, idiosyncratic to use, I guess it's designed for me, but, um, the reason I didn't share it is because there's actually a hero uh, called Jesus Freak who uh, his power makes you tweet something on Twitter. I didn't want people to accidentally tweet on Twitter, you know, something that they wrote or whatever. So I didn't want to share the program like publicly because it, it, it couldn't. I mean, it doesn't auto tweet it, but it might. You, I just don't want anybody to accidentally do anything, right. you know. So. But it has some kind of Twitter integration. Yes, yeah. If anything, that would improve Twitter. I think the world needs to. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mr. Bone. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. That's such a good idea. Um, you should continue to uh, you should continue to write these and share them. Also, you need to share some of your uh, some more of the supervillain concepts that are behind this. Now, the the supervillain concepts that you were sharing last week. Those are the same one. Some of the same ones that like are incorporated into this program, right? Yeah, um, a lot of the ones that I hit, and uh, and yeah, I did design the UI and all all this stuff. I use Construct Three, which is like this little tool for designing JavaScript based games. It's a, just an IDE that you can use to um, to do with the programming a little easier. Um, but yeah, the, some a lot of either because of the way like language works or something. Uh, like a lot of the ones that I got were like the S and the Q and the M came up a lot, which were just happened to be really kind of personal heroes. Um, one of them is one that has like kind of like this imposter syndrome type deal. And the other one uh, kind of has like a, a literal chip on her shoulder. I mean, her deal is that she grows microchips on her shoulder and as she goes to therapy, the microchips get smaller. So uh, those those chips can then be placed in increasingly smaller robots that can do more damage or whatever. So you know a lot of them were really personal that came up, and so a lot of the rules kind of skewed it towards like really kind of personal writing stuff. So and that's what I well, something you mentioned before is that you know um, just the element of inspiration and that kind of stuff. That is kind of why I designed the program because I knew that I wasn't going to get anything written with any of these characters or really anything at all in this type of universe without some kind of inspirational stuff. And I, I needed a framework, so I framed around my own life, I guess. that's, And that's what the tool is there to assist, really, is inspirational stuff. Yeah, that's a great fucking idea. I, uh, if you, you should send me the program at some point. I'll play around with it. Sure, yeah. <laughs> See what it generates. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for reading, man. Um, and that's all of our scheduled readers for tonight. Um, so I guess it's open mic time. We still have a little while. So if anyone would like to um, read, uh, now's the time. You can say so in the chat or you can just jump in here. Let's see. Anyone sitting on a piece that they'd like to read?
we could probably easily go for another half an hour or so if uh, if anyone had something they wanted to read. Does Sam not have another piece? Sam? Sam here. No, the open mic where he was like, uh, he had three separate pieces. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then like, it, it was pretty late. So I think Will kept trying to get rid of it. And I kept egging him on me like, Sam, do you have another, uh, you have a work in progress there? <laughs> God damn it, Sam. I don't know like, if tonight, but he should have banked one of those fucking pieces for tonight. Right, that was like the clown handkerchief thing where they keep pulling out my handkerchief. It was ridiculous. <laughs> oh, God. Um, Ryan, were you just volunteering in the chat? It seems like you said something that could be interpreted as volunteering. Uh -oh. Like, I have, I have a bunch of stuff, like, because I've been writing lately, but I don't know, like, <laughs> if it's good like i don't know if i technically like want to read it but i like i can if we're if we're trying to like if, if there's like no one else and like if there's like you should do it you should okay. read it. and if because... anyone decides they want to read while ryan is reading just put it in the chat and we'll uh i'm there but yeah definitely ryan Okay, okay. Um yeah, so worry this is... about the quality. I think like a lot of people come in here to workshop their stuff. I mean, I've read like shit that's not even close to being finished, you know. <laughs> so yeah, Okay. Definitely. Okay. Um so this is something I was trying. Um it's kind of like not really cuz it's cuz what we we do is doing is really cool. Um this is this is something um a user called Zoe Ozone turned me on to, which is writing using the um the dungeon mode in uh, AI dungeon, which you can get to the like the the third stage of GPT or whatever. So it's like it's like it's like stream conscious and stuff. It's not really like whatever, but I'll I'll read some of it, I guess, because um, it seems like vaguely on theme. So this is from um, a section from the novella I'm working on. Um, like this is from the first one. It's almost done. But I wanted there to be like five, so I don't know about it. But anyway, okay. So this is this is called Fawn. I'll just read like the beginning of it and sort of stop whenever. Um, okay. So warped elements of love, lacerated but surviving on broken hearts, pumping automatic smiles, the winds of war. One corpse whispered through, dust in the wind. She speaks, pain in your heart. Your heart once deployed the blood and oxygen through. Emotional, you expected nothing more. Zombies howl heartache set to music. Sadness, isolated in a jar, preserved like a fetal cat. Bitterness preserves us. Your smile is carved by broken dreams. Cherished, we are inside death. On the left wall is a drawing of a white heart hemorrhaging, spewing rat skeletons and angel feathers. A fawn is frozen mid-leaf. Below it, a single but bloody paw print. On the right wall is a chalk-drawn king sitting on a throne of skin and bones. Above him, a crown of thorns throttles a weeping man. Below this drawing is a scratched-out braille inscription, Quiet Monday. Flowers spring up through a cracked skull. They are made of fell. On the floor sits Mary, black ribcage exposed, facing you. She is sewing, sewing butterflies made of old money green and white scales with eyeliner tattooed with medieval runes that cause eyes to bleed. She looks up from her work. Her eyes appease you, comas in your pupils. Her dead smile quivers. Move in closer. She smells like strawberries and dead flowers. She raises an arm to ward you off, barely. Sniffling up tears, she wails. Her body is decorated and bound with colorful, colorful bruises. She stands, facing you. She whimpers, looking off suddenly, listening. Silence cascades and drips over you two. Struggling to breathe, she looks at you. She sinks into you, bone melting into tired muscle, cracked earth parting to reveal black stream water winding through desert landscapes of skin and burnt sienna and blush. Veins of black ichors serve as roads over which beasts of flesh and emotions travel. As you rest here, one bleached bone crumbles, ticks in the silence, shh, listen. She points to a glowing lesion on her elbow, not speckled by flecks of dried iodine and sweat. I hear the earth pass over our heads. Okay, I think that's all I'm gonna read, but 
yeah it's just like the 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 ai like just spits out like really impressionist imagery and you have to like guide it you have to like do resets and all that all that shit but yeah i was going to say that, the imagery of that's that what i'm trying fucking gorgeous i love that i love that the kind of like surreal like transporting all of your work has really amazing gorgeous imagery in it though and this really but this piece in particular it's like that was i don't know just I don't even like have the right language to describe it, but just, just completely immersive, completely beautiful, just like haunting imagery in that piece. That's so good. Yeah, I mean, that. you can you can thank the AI for most of that, but um, and it's uh, there's a lot of like text, weird textual shit that it spits out that I couldn't really narrate, but um, also, yeah, the idea is I was gonna like integrate this into like my no no novels where like the main character just sort of like thanks to the advanced internet or whatever like literature is like fully like an immersive trip so it's just something she does and that's like the trip and then it goes back to like the main story that was like the idea anyway yeah. thank you <laughs> it's it's a cool ai thing it's really cool i love the idea of like ai assisted writing for a while there a few years ago i had downloaded this predictive text editor and i was using it to write pieces i think some of them are up on the site now but i love the idea of like predictive text pieces or ai assisted pieces and it very much like it's kind of similar to rudy rudy's piece in that like you have this thing that gives you a very specific kind of prompt and a very provides a very specific kind of constraint and it really it can lead to some really incredible shit i think yeah, I just sort of like put really bad poetry into it and then it just starts spitting out shit and then yeah, I'm just like editing and like resetting and shit. Anyway, it's just like, yeah, it's a little experiment. So I, awesome. I hope it was cool. Yeah, that's Thank awesome. How, how does the dungeon, you said there's a dungeon? Component? Yeah, okay, how it works is you go to AI Dungeon and you kind of have to, like I had to pay for it. You have to pay for, um, it's called Dragon Mode, which unlocks like the latest AI model. Oh, okay. and but that's how you get to GPT three. Like you can do you can oh, do okay. websites and, sh and shit that are like working with GPT two. Yep. So far, that's the only way I know how to access, and it's working. So I'm probably gonna keep doing it. I think, but that's it's it's a user called Zoe Ozone who was doing it first. They're really cool. Um, awesome. Yeah. yeah, that was awesome. I really loved that. <laughs> Thank you. And yours was really cool, by the way. Yours was like mind blowing. So <laughs> Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, do we have anyone else who wanted to read? Rudy, did you catch anyone in the chat? I didn't see anybody come up in the chat here. Um, if not, this is kind of a last call thing. We can certainly call it a night. I mean, it is 930 um, on the East Coast anyway. And, Rudy, you wanted me to read something. I'll read anything. From yeah, Eris, here we go. Yeah. yeah. What do you have for us? I have teeth now. Uh -huh. you, holy shit, you have teeth again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what what a time to be alive let me do this i'm you know i'm gonna terrify you guys to do that oh shit right. um, okay why doesn't that lamp work so you want to what what page Oh, are you going to be reading from Ruthless Little Things? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Just pick a page at random. Oh, no, no, no. Who do you I thought wanted a certain page? Cute coat psychosis. Can you do cute coat psychosis? Okay. Okay. This is funny because this is a copy of a book where I spelled someone's name wrong, so I'm just keeping it. Oh, misery cannot compete with curiosity. I just passed by that sentence. Rudy, do you know what page is on? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's uh, 69. Hey, nice. 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 All right. Magsy wanted to strangle herself when reading her old live journals. She had to write a book, a book like a real book, and not the kind of book she wrote at her magnet elementary school. And she wanted to strangle herself. Courtney Love wants to... Never talk to me. 
Courtney Love once said that she wasn't psychic, but her lyrics were, and that's how Madsy felt about her writing. She wrote about being a drug addict before actually being one. She glamorized it and then lived it, glamorously sometimes, and then also the real banal agony of withdrawal to dismal addict day-to-day -day life. She hated what she was writing now, too fucking polluted by some boy she had been spending too much time with. Even now, writing something new, she felt it being read in his voice, like a fucking psycho, and she wanted him out of her head this very instant. Blast the whole record, talk to other people on Twitter, always thinking she was about to cry because of the cocaine. I always do too much cocaine. Not really a solitary thought, but one she idly imagined who she would tell that to. And the lesbian sex. God, she was so terrible at writing about that. She knew nothing of intimacy. Did she even now? Feelings of disgust washed over her, like all the dead skin cells already on her body from not showering. Avoid the body, it does not exist. Look, just because he's a Scorpio moon doesn't mean he can. Loud interrupting sigh from Madsy. God, she fucking hated when people did this. Put her in the middle. It happened with Tracy and Mila, and it happened with Star, 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 and Jordan, and now with these two fucking faggots. She laughed, thinking that to herself, <laughs> idly masturbating on the bed with her clit hard against the exposed mattress. I miss world. Watch me break and watch me burn. Courtney crooned from her shitty laptop her father brought, bought her. It was great and she wasn't complaining. She had to keep moving because if she was still for too long and then move the flies and then move, the flies would move everywhere. And that was just too cacophonic. There wasn't there. His voice was again, God damn it. How do I get rid of it? Fuck. She was tired of hearing the same old fucking thing but never getting it herself. It, what was it? The, oh baby, oh baby, I can be myself around you. Myself equals pervert, myself equals soft. Like God, it wasn't so fucking revolutionary to not have a sexual shame, my God. I'm not the, yeah, it's I, it's me, whatever. I don't know, whatever. I'm not the second coming of Christ. And quite frankly, God damn it, get out of my head. I'm so sick of this shit. I'm not even going to bother with any cute fucking joke about coming and sexual perversion. Who fucking cares? Everyone that I really loved is dead. Now it's all games. And it was all game. It's all game. Fuck you. And then there, there's like the rest of the chapter, but like, I just want to end on that vibe. And that reminds me of that, like, um, that tweet you posted about like, uh, Biden, like, you know, would I lie to you? Everyone I love is dead. <laughs> yeah. You still remember that tweet? <laughs> I remember. Although that was amazing. I really love the I, the way you get inside the, like, like the neuroticism of writing, like the that, like, nagging feeling, not only, like, that your work is bad, but that your work is somehow not your own. I mean, I... I I know I've been there too, where I'll be writing and I'll be like, no, this isn't me. This is like somebody else has gotten in here and they've like poisoned the well, right? And it's such, it's such a weird like phenomenon. And I think you capture it like really beautifully in that piece. Also, like, uh, as I said in the chat, that has big like Rudy's filthy bedroom energy that <laughs> sex. Ooh, wait, wait. I, I'm unfamiliar. Just, uh, oh, like the I think you and Rudy have actually talked before about like how badly you trash. I think you had like a comp competition as to who had trashed their I, bedroom more badly. That McDonald's trash. That's when yes. it's on my heart, man. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, that I love the energy of that piece. And like I said, your uh, your writing always has this voice that is like so uh, like vivid. <laughs> I don't really know any other way to describe. I said in the chat. They said it's oh. almost like um like Daria mixed with Salo. <laughs> like, Daria mixed with who? Uh, I was thinking of the the Pierre Paolo Pasolini uh Salo, 120 Days of Sodom the movie. It's like all this like <laughs> all the horrible shit, but it's so it's so like lyrical and like poetic. It's just it's awesome. And coming from me. Like, 
I would never, I can't say that anymore. Anyway, I just stop somewhere. Anyway, thank you. No, I love it. It was a pleasure to read that out loud. I forgot how fucking insane I was. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much for reading, Eris. I'm, I'm sorry that I missed everyone again. No, oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> Hey, that's why we record these things, right? Um, so I think last call here. Does anyone want to read? Does anyone have anything else they want to read? If not, I'm going to shut this thing down for the night. Carter. I, I think we're good. So uh, <laughs> I, I have something, but I'm going to save it. it. It's a little on the longer side. So I'm going to I'm going to book one of the main slots in the next couple of weeks. It's coming out on expat at the end of the month. So I'll try and read it before then. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Oh, just cool. shoot me a DM and I'll add you to the list for whenever uh, you want to read. Nice. So yeah, so I guess that's it for tonight. I'm going to leave the Zoom meeting up probably for who, who knows how fucking long after this. But if you're watching this at home, this has been Misery Loves Company. Uh, you can um, follow us on Twitter at Misery Tourism and come to a future show. We do this every Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. Pacific. It's open to fucking everyone. Just don't come in and troll. If you come in and you're waving your little dick around or whatever, we're going to boot you. <laughs> But if you come in and you behave yourself, if you want to read, you want to lurk, that's fine. Okay. If you come in and you've written a story about waving your little dick around, that's like, you know, that's going to fly. Yeah, yeah no, that's 100% yeah. fine. Just don't do any shit that I'm going to have to edit out before I put this up on YouTube. I'm All right. Fly. I see what you don't, don't make him do that. <laughs> okay. This is over. I've ended this shit.